I'm speaking with Professor Sandra Weller of the University of Connecticut. Thanks for joining me today, Sandy. Thanks, Vince. Can I call you Sandy? You may. This chat is about DNA replication, or I should say, this chat is for the chapter on DNA replication. I want to start out by asking you to tell us about where you were born and educated. All right. Well, I was born in Pasadena, California. <laughs> that brings back all kinds of images. Right. Well, I was a kind of <laughs> surfer girl in yeah. the 60s. Um, then I went to Stanford, got my bachelor's. We, we skipped high school. You went to high school in we Pasadena? Went to Blair High School, Pasadena, California. Okay. Um, what did you major in at Stanford? I majored in biology and chemistry. Okay. And I got interested in viruses when I was in high school, actually. How so? I was dating a young man whose father was a virologist, and he was a retrovirologist. His name was wow. Robert McAllister. He was <laughs> hunting for human retroviruses. Uh -huh. There weren't any at the time, but it was a very interesting project. And he had six children, none of whom were interested in science. And I was very interested in science, he was, so he adopted me. I got to work in his lab. and. Got very interested in retroviruses when I was in high school. Wow. But then I went to Stanford and I had to work on other things like bacterial membranes because I couldn't find any virologists. Just, but I was still very interested in, in retroviruses. So when I was going to go to graduate school, I applied to uh, University of Wisconsin, Madison, because I wanted to work for Howard, Howard Temin, who was working on retroviruses, avian retroviruses. So you knew of Howard Temin from... I knew it from, from Dr. McAllister, huh. yeah. And I either wanted to work for Howard Temin at uh, Wisconsin or David Baltimore at MIT, but I ended up going to Wisconsin and uh, studied retroviruses. As I was finishing that degree, I realized I wanted to, we still hadn't found any human retroviruses. Mm -hmm. This is during the 70s. There were no human retroviruses. I was studying an avian retrovirus, and we, there was a lot of work done in murine retroviruses, but there were no human retroviruses. And so I decided to change fields to do a postdoc because I wanted to work on a virus that caused human disease. <laughs> Since retroviruses didn't cause human diseases, I had to leave retroviruses. I went to work in herpes, and I worked with Priscilla Schaefer at Harvard Medical School. Six months after being a postdoc, after I started my postdoc, Bob Gallo came to the Dana-Farber and gave us a talk, and I realized, oh my goodness, there is actually, there are human retroviruses. And it was sort of, hmm. I'm not, I don't know if it was, uh, it was quite surprising, because I had, I had left the field because I wanted to, to study human pathogens, and, we, and I, I could have gone back into the retroviral field, but I also wanted to do genetics, and avian retroviruses had, only four genes, and I wanted to do some more complicated <laughs> genetics. So, well, and human retroviruses actually had a lot more. It would have yeah. been, a, but I had already moved. I moved on to herpes, and so I did a postdoc until about 1984. Moved to Connecticut, assistant professor, and been there ever, ever since. since. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you if you thought about going back at any point in your career. You could work on a retrovirus. Anyway. I could, I could, but I sort of fell in love with herpes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Odd as that may. May sound, I, but unlike love, herpes is forever. Herpes is forever, right? <laughs> That's what Saul always says. <laughs> there are a number of jokes, most of which I would not <laughs> tell by on a tape. But if Saul start, if Saul told them to, you couldn't repeat them. Mm. That's right. <laughs> Saul is a colleague of ours. Yeah. So it was this experience in high school working with a retrovirologist. That got you interested in science? No, I was interested in science in seventh grade. I had a particularly engaging teacher, Mr. McCoy, and he wanted us <laughs> to do uh, a science project. And being in Pasadena, I, I realized that Caltech was down the street, and I can't remember where I got the idea, but I wanted to work in, with fruit flies, so I was studying Drosophila. So I went over. And I ended up in Seymour Benzer's lab just to grab some, so he, I, I must have written ahead and I, I picked up a, a vial of red-eyed fruit flies and a vial of white-eyed fruit flies and I was going to do some mm. genetics. And uh, that led me on an incredible odyssey of learning how to cook because you had to, I had to make the media. You know, I had to right, make the media right. that I could grow the flies in. So, you know, most, my parents really thought I was crazy. My father was an attorney, my mother was a politico kind of person. So it was, you know, having a daughter that was interested in science was totally outside their experience. They were very worried about me, actually, because they didn't really think I'd be able to find a career doing science. But 
you know, at a time when most mothers of teenage girls were tearing their hair because the girls are sullen, surly, and then wanting to be driven to the mall to go shopping. I was, I asked, I asked to be driven to the uh, scientific supply store to buy equipment to be able to make. Uh, so, I, and I learned how to cook this way because I had to make the media, and it yeah. had to be just the right consistency. Because if it's too soft, the the fruit flies would fly in it and they would die. And mm -hmm. if it was too hard, the larvae couldn't do the crawling thing they have to do. So. So it was, mm. yeah, so I, I knew I wanted to do science when I was in the eighth grade. So was there a point in your career where your parents were content that you had found something you liked? Oh, even in high school, they were so nervous <laughs> that, that they had both gone to UC Berkeley, and they called up a sorority sister of my mother's and, who had liked science, and she was a technician. Mm -hmm. And they said, we're so worried. Sandy's really just seems to like science, and I don't, we don't think that there's a career there for a, a girl. I mean, they were really... And my father, you know, he just was, he wanted there to be a career. So they, they were told that I could be a technician and, and, and there would be work in laboratories. So then they were okay. They were all right with it after right. that. Was it exciting to work in Howard Temin's lab? Absolutely. He was brilliant. And it rubbed off on you? Absolutely. <laughs> well, the one thing that did rub off on me, I think, and, is he was a very intuitive scientist, right? And his whole... You know, his whole prediction that retroviruses would replicate through a DNA intermediate and that there would be a reverse, an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. A lot of that was very intuitive, and, and he was a very intuitive biologist. Mm. And I think sometimes scientists have to give themselves permission to be intuitive. Sometimes they, they get kind of locked into projects where they're going to do the next logical step and, and the next one and the next one, and... and I've, I've found that the things that have given me the most satisfaction in my career are things where I kind of took a leap, a, a little bit of a, gee, I wonder if that could be happening. Mm. So it, I think, I like to think that I was able to, to sort of learn yeah. from, from Howard's, I don't think I will ever be as brilliant as he was, but <laughs> I know I'm not, but, but uh, and it was, you know, we lost him way too early. How did you get interested in DNA replication? So when I went to Priscilla's lab as a postdoc, uh, I initially wanted to work in herpes simplex virus because we thought they caused cervical cancer. In those days, it was right after a large epidemiological study had been done, and the, the correlations at the time were that uh, in young girls, the age, of, the age of first sexual experience and numbers of sexual partners uh, predisposed cervical cancer. And at the time, we didn't know about papillomavirus. Right. Right. And so the first, uh, the first idea was that it was herpes simplex. And people started working on fragments. It was right about the time when the genome was first cloned. And the fragments of the viral genome that were, people were putting them into mouse, 3T3 cells, and looking for, for transformation. Yeah. And they actually thought that a particular, there were two regions of the herpes genome that they thought were transforming. And that was very exciting. So I thought I was going to work on cancer. Um, one of the fragments that we thought might be transforming was one that contained two viral replication proteins, the, the DNA binding protein and the polymerase. And hmm. those two proteins are flanking an, or a region that we, that we came to find was the origin. So I started working on that region of the <laughs> genome and, and really just fell in love with sort of thinking about, you know, we didn't know which, how many viral proteins were uh, involved in DNA replication. We didn't know if the virus encoded the replication proteins or if there were cellular proteins. You know, we knew that SV40 really only had one DNA replication protein that was virally encoded and that mm. it used the cellular proteins to replicate mm -hmm. its genome. And, and we didn't know whether herpes how many herpes viral proteins there were. And we had a lot of temperature sensitive mutants. One of the reasons I went to Priscilla's lab was that she'd isolated dozens of temperature sensitive mutants. Mm -hmm. um, they had a genetic map. They knew sort of the order of the genes and we knew that the polymerase was next to the, the DNA binding protein, but we didn't have any physical mapping of the, of the region. And we didn't really know where the, we knew there could be an origin in that region, but we didn't know where it was. So I started doing physical mapping, you know, the marker rescue. And what I found was that the clones that I was using, the, all the restriction fragments that we cloned, contained deletions in this region. There were, we could not make a full-length clone, which 
I, I, I turned out, I figured out why, but it was, it was sort of surprising. Why can't we clone this region? What, what's wrong? Why can't we propagate this region in bacteria? And I was doing marker rescue, trying to map the temperature-sensitive mutants, and I was able to map several temperature-sensitive mutants of, of, of the DNA binding protein, and I got very interested in why we couldn't clone that region. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how I met Max Gottesman. I, I was at a conference, and I, and I reported that, I, we, that we, this was a very deletion-prone region, and I, and I knew that there were, there were several different deletions that could be made, some of them small, some of them large. And Max Gottesman heard me talk, and he said, I have a cloning strategy that I know is going to work. And so he said, come down to Washington. Come down. He was at the NIH at the time. He said, come down to Washington. And, uh, and, and it's, it was a lysogenic lambda cloning system where the idea was that if you the idea was that if we could integrate this sequence into the lambda genome, or into the bacteri bacterial genome quickly enough, mm. it, it maybe wouldn't delete. We figured that it was being deleted by, by E. coli recombination proteins. Right. But the idea was that if you could make a lysogen, it wouldn't. So I spent several weeks cloning this thing, and it's still deleted. Mm -hmm. So then the next, the next trial was to try to clone it in yeast. I thought, well, maybe yeast won't, mm -hmm. won't, won't delete the sequence. So I collaborated with Andrew Murray, who was in Jack Shostak's lab at the time. And we did clone it in yeast, and we were able to make an undeleted clone. But by that time, I was just so curious about what was in the sequence that, that was causing deletions, so I decided I wanted to sequence it, and I couldn't get enough DNA out of the yeast to really mm -hmm. sequence it, so I decided to, to sequence directly from the viral genome. And in those days, that was not easy to do, and we used Maxim and Gilbert sequencing, mm -hmm. so I made lots of DNA and cut out the restriction fragments, labeled one end, and, and I went to Alan Maxim's lab and learned how to sequence. So, Collaborations obviously can mm -hmm. be very important in one's career. So we, I, with, a, with a postdoc from Allen's lab, we were able to sequence that origin of replication. And I'll never forget one Saturday I was doing my reads. I was reading off the sequence. And I read a sequence, and then I read another region, and it was the same sequence. And I read another region, and it was the same sequence. And I realized that I had a totally perfect 144 base pair palindrome in this region. And no one had known that before. So 72 on a side. And not only that, but it contained many internal, hmm. indirect and direct repeats. So in the end, explaining why it was so deletion prone, because the coli enzymes were, right. were, making, were making deletions. And, um, and that was just a very exciting project to all of a sudden. Hmm. You know, so I, you know, I cloned the first copy of that origin and realized why it was, it was so origin, why it was so deletion prone. So you allowed your curiosity to lead you, right? Right. Right. The curiosity about this origin and the flanking regions, and that's important in science, right? Well, I've, you know, my career has taken me a lot of directions since I started that project, and I, when I went to to start my own lab, I decided I want to keep working with with DNA replication, and we only had three of the replication proteins at the time, mm -hmm. and we figured there must be more. We had other DNA negative. Uh, temperature-sensitive mutants that Priscilla right. had, had had in her collection, and so I was able to map them all. And so I, I roughly figured out where the regions of the DNA replication proteins were, and uh, we, I think we identified all seven that way. And then Mark Chalberg came up with a transfection-based assay to map the, the, the actual seven genes. And, right. and, so, and I remember com conversations with him Weekly, we'd call we'd call each other, and I, he'd say, I, "I found another gene," and I said, "Oh, I think I have a TS mutant in that." So we were able to to really line up the pro, the, the the clones that he was mm -hmm. uh, identifying uh, using his transfection based replication assay with the genetics telling us where the genes were, and and as soon as we started, and it, and then shortly thereafter, the sequence became available of the entire herpes genome. Duncan McGeeck from MRC. Mm -hmm. Glasgow had cloned, the, had sequenced the entire genome, and then we could line up our genes. Right. And oh, that one looks like it might be a helicase. Oh, that one looks like it might be, <laughs> you know, a DNA binding protein. And and ever since I've sort of let the virus lead me into yeah. into you know we started doing replication biochemistry because once we saw that we might have a helicase, then we had to express that protein in E. coli and eventually had to express it in baculo and insect right. cells in order to make a functional protein. Then we realized that it was making a complex of three proteins, the helicase primase, had three subunits. So just 
and then we started doing cell biology. So really, every time you know we had a question, we had to learn a brand new technology yeah. in order to do it. So I was very lucky to be in the department I was in because we had a lot of really good biochemists. I had I'd been a genetics geneticist mm -hmm. up to that point. I was interested in mapping genes. And once we'd mapped the ones we were interested in, I realized, oh, now I have to become a biochemist. And luckily, I was in a really good department that I could do that yeah. and uh, purified proteins and started doing helicase assays. And I still am very interested in those proteins. So. Can you point out a key experiment from this time to having to do with DNA replication? Well, one thing that we've become very curious about, and even we're at the beginning, has to do with the mechanism of replication. So the, the replication systems that had been studied up until the point of the 80s when I started my, my own lab were SV40, which is a mm -hmm. circular DNA molecule, which has an origin of replication. Tantagen binds to it, replicates bidirectionally all around the circle. You get two con concatenomers at the end. It's very orderly. They separate. Now you have two daughter mm -hmm. strands. And that seemed like it's a very simple, elegant model. Herpes is not that well behaved. So <laughs> it's a linear genome, and although there has been a model that proposed that, that the viral genome circularizes and that, lam that rolling circle replication mm -hmm. occurs, like lambda, right. phage, uh, we really don't have any direct evidence that the viral genome circularizes, and in fact, we don't think re rolling circle replication is the mode, is, is the primary mode of replication. I, I can't say that it never happens, but I don't think it's the primary mode. And we think recombination plays a big role in this. Mm -hmm. And we have now been able to isolate a viral recombinase that we think is analogous, and we know it is analogous to the lambda system, actually. Mm -hmm. Lambda, you know, the lambda red alpha beta proteins, which, yeah. which can do recombinating. We have, herpes has a lambda, has an exo that's related to lambda exo, and it has a DNA binding protein that actually acts as a single strand annealing protein. So it has an exo plus a single mm -hmm. strand annealing protein, and that's really all you need to do single strand annealing. So we, we actually think now that the virus uses single strand annealing to replicate its genome, and it's not necessarily rolling circle. And although it's still controversial, and we haven't, nailed all the mm -hmm. nails into the coffin in terms of proving it, we, we believe that, that it's using a really fundamentally different mechanism of DNA replication from all other viruses, mm -hmm. except maybe lambda, lambda may also use this kind of mechanism. Are you still continuing to work on this problem today? Absolutely. It's one of the most exciting ones that we so do. So can you give us some idea of some of the things you're doing? Well, so the so the this recombinase, which is made up of a, of a nuclease and a single strand binding protein, mm -hmm. that single strand binding protein is the same single strand binding protein that that is that that you, is used for replication. So it's actually used in both processes, and we're very interested. That protein by itself can form filaments in solution, and it can also form yeah. a filament on a single strand DNA. Mm -hmm. And we're very interested in 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 how how that ability to form filaments relates to its other properties in the cell. It's a multifunctional protein. It, it's involved in DNA replication. It's involved in recombination. It's also involved in how the virus manipulates the nucleus. Uh, this virus totally reorganizes the nucleus, so mm -hmm. it, it makes these very large replication compartments that take up almost the entire volume of the nucleus. And one question we have right now is, wh what's the nature of those replication compartments, and how are they forming? And we think that the ability of ICP-8 to form filaments may be related to its ability to... These, co these compartments take up almost the entire nucleus, mm. even when DNA replication isn't happening. So how would that kind of space filling occur? And what we think is happening is that we have a series of filaments that are forming kind of a meshwork of, of ICP-8, maybe uh, along with, with multivalent weak interactions, that are that are forming kind of a scaffold on which, mm -hmm. on which, other other replication proteins can form, and then eventually replication forks can form. So we're very interested in replication fork assembly, how it forms in the cell, maybe on some of these matrices, if, if the filaments are forming matrices. We're also interested in in these replication compartments. Uh, 
you know, you've seen IF pictures of them, I'm sure, and I'm, I think there was one in the, from my lab in the book the last right. time. And these compartments look like they might have membranes around them. They just look so delineated from the rest mm -hmm. of the nucleus. And you think, well, we know there's no membrane, but how would, how would a structure form that has such a, a, a tight bear, you know, boundary between where there, isn't, where there is ICP-8 and where there isn't? And so we think we're very excited about, these, about sort of the biophysical properties that would allow this to happen. And um, even some of the work that we heard at this meeting about uh, phase transitions and things like uh, str uh, stress granules that are made up of, of, of complexes of proteins and in some cases nucleic acid that form these loose networks that, that actually allow you to form something that looks like an organelle. And, right. and hmm. you know, cells are not just bags of enzymes. They're all, they're, there's so much structure to be learned about. So, so we're very interested in whether, what kind of structures are being made and if, if they really need re filaments. And now we have mutants that don't make filaments and we're trying to figure out what, what's needed in ICP-8 to make a filament. And we'd really like to do some, um, in terms of, of, of technology that's new that we can use, I think we'd like to use some, some much higher resolution microscopy that might actually help us look in more detail at, at, at what kind of filaments are being formed and how that affects the in, vi in vivo in an infected cell, how that affects the replication compartment formation. You should talk to Clota O'Shea. I just spent three hours with Clota O'Shea okay. just now. <laughs> Because no, her we, filaments are no. Her fil I, in fact, the, that cell paper that she wrote is one that we read all over and over yeah. and over again. And so I was, we were just showing her. Actually, in fact, my student gave a talk at this meeting, and and Claude uh -huh. uh, approached us afterwards. And I, I've known Claude for years, so we had a great conversation. Great. So, uh, how has technology changed in the years that you've been working in ways that you that you have used? So. At every step, you're, you, you tend to, of your career, you tend to be limited by not having something. So right before I joined Priscilla's lab and they had all these temperature sensitive mutants and they, they mapped them by recombination. So you infect a cell with two temperature sensitive mutants and measure the frequency of recombination. Mm -hmm. and, and then we had, then recombinant DNA came out. So then we had clones of, of each of the restriction fragments from across the genome and we could do actual marker rescue by, by mixing the, TS mutant DNA with the small fragments. So right. that, was, that was high technology in, <laughs> in, the, in the mid 80s. And, and around that time, people started doing confocal microscopy and using, uh, using immunofluorescence. And so we were able to see replication compartments because we had antibodies mm -hmm. to the different DNA. David Knipe did that initial work and, and uh, we were able to, to do that. So every, you know, even just the, mo the crudest confocal microscopes told us a lot. But, uh, I, I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of, uh, from my own work, the value of some of, microscopy is just hmm. exploding in terms of its ability to, to see smaller and smaller, uh, it, with higher and higher resolution to see structures that, almost at the atomic level, I mean, it's really amazing that, that people are, all, you know, it, 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 I, I don't want to say this in a way that my call it my exocrystallographer colleagues will hear about, but it, it, microscopy could replace crystallography in a, in a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of ways. Um, so certainly the microscopy, um, the ability to do proteomics and look at uh, establish networks of of protein interactions. Because I, I didn't mention it, but we're also very interested in in the host cell responses to these viruses and looking at which cellular proteins are coming into the viral uh, replication compartments and then uh, being able to, to confirm pro, you know, direct protein protein interactions using a number of, of methods and, uh, and, and doing some, we're doing some biophysical analysis. We're, we're looking at, at ligamerization using you know, different new kinds of dynamic light scattering uh, there's really beautiful instruments for you know making it a lot easier. Uh, we still do analytical to centrifugation, which is a rather old school technique, but but we also can now do fluorescence correlation spectroscopy and dynamic light scattering, and and uh, it's really been enjoyable for me to learn each each time to realize that there's a new there's something new out there that we can apply. Mm 
And who knows what's going to be in the next five or ten years right. that we couldn't even think about now. But, but it really does change the way we... You hit, a, you hit a roadblock and you can't solve that problem until, un, until a new technology comes out and then... Hmm. You don't use a Model E, do you? Analytical centrifugation. I did when I was a graduate student. <laughs> um, I actually send my sample over to my colleague over on the Stores campus who runs the National Labs for Analytical okay. Centrifugation, and I don't, I haven't actually seen, I don't think it's a Model E. Probably not, yeah. Probably not. But you remember them, right? I absolutely remember Elephants, them. Elephants, huge. Yeah, no, I took up the entire, the entire room. Yeah, that's another trend, miniaturization, right? Yes, yeah. It's amazing. No, it's true. So of, of all the work you've done in science, of all sorts, what, what would you single out as that which has had the most effect on the field? Well, I'm not sure if my work had an effect on this field, but I'll tell you the, the, the project that thrilled me the most when, we, when it was finally, and it has to do with new technologies telling you something that you didn't, you hit a roadblock. And, so when I was a graduate student, I studied uh, avian retroviruses, and I discovered that some of them were cytopathic. They could kill cells. Mm. And that wasn't known. Retroviruses are not normally thought of as being cytopathic. They, they can go in and, and they can integrate and, and they do so in a way that usually doesn't kill the cell. So it was kind of an unusual finding. In fact, when I first made that observation, I remember Howard being very skeptical, Dr. Tubman being very skeptical of it. And you know, I, I, I don't think he ever said this, but I definitely got the feeling that he thought that retroviruses don't kill cells. First year graduate students do kill cells. <laughs> but I was right. <laughs> the, the virus was killing the cell. I finally was able to convince him. And, and, and I mapped the, it, there were different subgroups. Mm. There's a genetic system of, of avian leukosis viruses. Some of them affect, could use one receptor, some could use another receptor. And there were, some subgroups were cytopathic and some of them weren't. And we discovered, I discovered that the cytopathic retroviruses uh, had a very unusual property of, of when I ran, when I separated the cells that were dead from the cells that were alive, the dead cells had this ladder of DNA if I ran a DNA gel. And so the DNA, the, the cellular DNA was becoming fragmented. And it really was a surprising finding and, and, and we didn't know what it was and Howard didn't want to publish it, but I said, I think we should publish this because somebody, someday somebody will figure this out. Someday somebody will figure out why, why this mm -hmm. happened. And sure enough, 16 years later, I was organizing a FASIB meeting, invited John Young to speak, and I'd never met John. I knew that he and Paul Bates had, had cloned the first avian leukosis virus receptors, and they cloned, the first one they cloned was a non-cytopathic receptor. And I was hoping that they would clone a, re a cytopathic receptor, and they hadn't yet. They did this when they were in Harold Varamus's lab. Mm -hmm. But he stood up and he said, 16 years ago, Sandy Weller published the first apoptotic ladder and the first fragmented ladder. And he said, now we have cloned the receptor for that virus, and it's a TNF family member and induces apoptosis. Mm. So I believe that I discovered apoptosis, but I had no clue what it was, and I, and I, and I, I had no way of knowing what it was, and it wasn't until... John was able to clone the receptor and the technology had, had advanced so that they could you know, do a mm. whole cDNA clone of cells and figure out what was the actual receptor that we realized what it was. Of course, at the time, no one knew about apoptosis at all, right? No, and I was do, doing our work, but, but it just it, it made a perfect story yeah. that the very Great. receptor that was used, and he proved that in a ligand-specific way, you could induce apoptosis yeah. by just treating it with the, with the glycoprotein from that particular retrovirus. Right, that's great. And the saddest thing about that was that Howard had actually passed away two years before that. And yeah. I, it would have been a story that he would have absolutely loved. At least he let you publish it, right? He did let me publish it. And so, that's good. So I just was on cloud nine that finally that, sure. had, been, that, that had been solved. That's a good story. So if you had not become a scientist, what else would you have done? At the time, I thought I would become a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was because my father was a lawyer. And my father, you know, I, I liked math and I was good at math. And I and my father convinced me, and I think it's true that that a lot of attorneys are very logical. And they and 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 he had always loved math as well. So I sort of thought, well, that would be something that I could 
I could do with, with that interest of mine. Um, at the time, actually, I should say that he was an attorney and he had accountants that worked in his office. And so he actually wanted me to become an accountant because I could use the math. But that didn't thrill me so much. But in, re in recent years, I, I, I've just decided that if I was going to do something else, I would probably want to do psych be a psychologist. <laughs> Because it's just, you know, after you've been in this field for a while and you've had a lot of students and you've had a lot of colleagues, I am also a chair of my department, and you, <laughs> the more you deal with people, the more you're dealing with different kinds of people and, and <laughs> just trying to figure out what makes, what makes different people tick, what makes, what makes some students motivated by certain things, what, you know, how to motivate each student, how to, how to, some students love it when you look over their shoulder every time they're developing a new gel and, 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 and try to discuss with them right away what their pri I hated that. I hated it for <laughs> myself. If I was to work, if I took a film off the, off the Exomat and was trying to figure out what it was, if someone asked me what the result was at that point, I was furious. I, give me time, give me time. So some people like to be kind of coddled and, mm. and paid a lot of attention to. Others just want to be independent and don't want to tell you their results until they already figure it out. So. So just looking at different, at, you know, people. So you know, figure out why that is, right? Why, why do people, I, don't, I just find, I find people fascinating, so. What advice would you have for readers of this book who are thinking about have, having a career in science? That's a good question. First of all, I think the book's fabulous. I teach it, I use it Thank you. in my teaching. And I, uh, I really like I like the way that chapters are laid out and, and important observations are put in boxes so that the students can see them. And, and very often, if we have time, we go back and we read those papers. Mm. And, and I think it really makes a lot, of, uh, a lot of sense to try to go back to that original literature and, and sort of say, you know, it's sort of classic papers, and some of these papers are, you know, you have to go back to when people were making their own isotopes. And <laughs> You know, right. Some of the really classic, you know, ex you know Messelson stall experiments, but but it's it gives you an appreciation for how far we've come when you read some of these old papers and you realize you realize a lot of things. First of all, how persistent they had to be in, mm. in order to, you know, there was no such thing as going to the refrigerator and freezer and pulling out a restriction enzyme. I mean, if you, right, right. you know, you'd. We used to isolate, we used to purify them ourselves because we didn't have. Yeah. Mike Bishop told us how he used to make S thirty five methionine. Yeah, no, that's right, that's right. So the farther you go back, the more surprising it is of things yeah. that we take for granted. Of oh yeah, we're just going to call it biolabs and they're going to deliver this and that and they'll bring it in the buffer that you need. And but it is good to have things made so you can spend time doing it. Well, it certainly right? gives you more time yeah. to, to to think about the experiments. Um, and I, I I know from even this last class I've taught with using the book, is that it's really, I think students really do get excited about virology. Virology is still very important, and, and uh, just learning about how viruses have evolved to take advantage of the cells that they're in and, and evade host cell immunity and establish what they establish. And you know, herpes viruses have been with us since we were us. I mean, they've really, the yeah. evolution, the co-evolution between these, between us and the viruses have resulted in this kind of evolutionary arms race that is very fascinating now to, to look at. And I, I think um, I would certainly recommend that students pursue a career in this field. It's a very rewarding one. Um, there's always things to learn. We, ha we, we certainly have uh, only scratched the surface. And uh, it, it's important work. Viruses are still killing us. They're still killing a lot of people. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. Every time I, you know, you think about a, an accomplishment we've made in this field, you know, we've we almost eradicated polio. Maybe we have now, but... You know, it's still almost. It's still almost, and <laughs> and and you know, smallpox, and and then even in the late seventies, when I said, "Well, we don't have any human retroviruses." Well, starting in nineteen eighty, we we have a really remarkable, a remarkably serious epidemic on our hands that yeah. we still haven't solved, and we still don't have a vaccine, and we have some pretty good drugs, but we still have a lot to learn, and. <laughs> 
not to mention the fact that viruses have taught us almost everything that we know about a eukaryotic cells. I mean, we learned about splicing, we learned about intercellular transport, we learned about how receptors work, we learned about DNA replication, even cellular DNA replication was discovered only because SV, by SV40, because SV40 was utilizing the cellular factors. So hopefully students will just want, realize how wonderful viruses are. <laughs> <laughs> how important is a good mentor for students? Mentors are very important. Um, you know, Howard was a very different kind of mentor than, Howard was very formal and uh, One thing that happened when I was working with Howard is I was his first female student. Mm -hmm. And that made him very nervous. And at the time I was sort of surprised by it because I didn't really see, I'd been an undergraduate at Stanford. I never, I never felt obvious effects of sexism or people that didn't think I was good enough. I mean, it se seemed like I, I'd never really run across gender discrimination. And yet he, either because he was married to a geneticist, Rayla is a, is a, was a first class geneticist herself, um, and maybe she was advising him, but when I first started in the lab, he was worried that he wouldn't be a good mentor to me, only because he wasn't female. <laughs> hmm. and, he, and he insisted that my entire thesis committee be female because he wanted to provide me with role models. And at the time I thought that was very silly because I really didn't, I really hadn't seen the effects of, of gender discrimination. And, and by the time I left, I, I actually was very grateful for him to, for having done that. And it didn't work out that I kept the same, I mean, I did have, we had a lot of female virologists, mm -hmm. like Martha Howe and Mary Osborne, and, and there were some good, good, there were good mentors, but um, it, it was, it, it struck me as a very kind and a thoughtful thing for him to do, to, to realize that you know, and there certainly are lifestyle choices that you have to think about, and 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 it is harder for, and and there is a lot of, of gender bias still in our field, and um, so having having role models of people that, um, you know, par part of the reason for the gender discrimination is that women do leave the pipeline because they want to have families and they think they can't have a family if they do this career. I I. I have two children. I'm, you know, it's it's been a wonderful thing for me to be able to do that. Not an easy thing, but, but I I hope that by realizing that I've been able to do that and raise two wonderful boys, that it is possible to, to to have a career. But it's not, you know, there are sacrifices. Sure. You know, there were days that I felt like I wasn't being a good mom if I was doing my experiments, and I wouldn't wasn't being a good scientist if I was going over to a soccer game. So it's. Mm. But, but having role models, having people to talk to, having people, that, having people to, to help you at different stages of your career. Uh, now that I'm a chair, I, I try to be a good mentor to my faculty. And you know, I read their grants. I try to promote them in you know, giving talks at national meetings and just trying to, having somebody that can just be thoughtful about talking to you about career development is very important, Become, being a role model. You know, sometimes you learn what kind of a mentor, what kind of scientist to be by either watching your mentor and realizing you don't want to be like that person or <laughs> that you do. But um, after I, Howard was very, Howard Tumman was a very good mentor, but he, he was very formal when we were in his lab. So as a student, we called him Dr. Tumman and we were, it was a very formal relationship. And I never forget the day after I defended my thesis, there's a note on my desk signed Howard. And after that, he was a friend. <laughs> it, you know, he really, he, but he felt he took that job extremely seriously, yeah. and he wanted to be a good mentor. Hmm. Um, but he, after I left, he would invite me back and give me seminars and gave me a lot of opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. So, for a young person entering the field, students, postdocs, even, how do you identify this good mentor? What are the important qualities? Well. Someone who's willing to talk to you and talk to you about career development would mm -hmm. be, would, you know, th there are some people in this world, as we were talking about understanding people who are more interested in themselves than they are into, mm -hmm. in, in promoting someone else. So those people are kind of toxic and, and hopefully young students would know enough or would, would, would get a feeling of yeah. that person may not be interested in me as a person. I want to I wanna work with someone who's interested in, in, in my career development, um, a good teacher. Sure. And I, think, I don't think there's just one good mentor. I mean, even though you pick a thesis advisor who's going to be a mentor, 
you need to have multiple mentors. So, and, and, and I think students should choose their, their uh, advisory committees based on, on being able to, to know that they can go into, sit down, they can go into that person's office anytime and say, I'm, I'm having this problem with this gradient. Can you help me out? Or can you, or I, I need to decide whether I should go into, you know, should I do a postdoc? Should I go into industry? You know, just people that you can talk to. I think, it, I think mentoring is really critical. And, um, and I think it's important for us to, for, as mentors, to, to really just be able to listen. Sometimes I don't listen as well as I should. I'm feeling like I should always be there just to be a person that, that they can talk to. And it's not always going to be your thesis. Your best mentor may not be your thesis advisor or your postdoctoral mentor, but, but another colleague, you know, sure. peer mentors are important. The students that come in together, they're often very supportive for each other. But it's important to have, have mentors. And in these days, it's really important to have people that will help you out in a lot of ways, like reading your papers, writing your, reading your grants. This is not a time for cowboy science or I'm doing it on my own, I don't need any help. It's just really not a time for that because you know, with the funding climate being as hard as it is, it's really important to craft a, a, a grant and the way to do it, craft the best grant is to have people that are, are willing to look at it for you. And it's time consuming, it takes a lot of time. I've been speaking with Professor Sandra Weller of the University of Connecticut. Thanks for talking with me today, Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, it was a lot of fun.